Now, one of the most controversial people in the world uh, was an Englishman. He came from a very, very important family. Uh, his mother was a Wedgwood, uh, and the Darwins, which was his last name, uh, were not just nothing. I mean, they were distinguished uh, lawyers, ministers, and scientists, even before Charles showed up. So um, Charles Darwin, and now throughout America, I mean, he is this issue. Uh, because in 1859 he published a book. And that book is called The Origin of Species. And uh, in The Origin of Species, and in a book that followed 12 years later in 1871, The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin articulated this idea that life has been in continuous change that it is much older than the Bible indicates, and moreover, that we human beings are not some kind of special creation, that we are part of the changing process of life, the evolutionary process of life, and that we have our roots in organic forms that preceded us. So if our roots are there, then that means that our body, whatever the shape, our organs uh, are very clearly descended from the bodies and organs of earlier life. And then we come to something more problematic, our behavior. Oh. Our feelings and our behavior, well, do they have the same roots? Well, maybe my liver is related to a fish liver, you know. But certainly not my mind or my emotions or my behavior. And certainly not to monkeys. That's what Darwin got. Are you saying, are you, are you Charles, or did they call him Chuck? I don't know. Are you, I don't, what do I know? I mean, if I wasn't in the family. Right. Are you Charles, are you saying that we are personally related to monkeys and apes? His answer, of course, was yes. So, if you want to look at your closest evolutionary relatives, you go to the zoo. And you can watch the monkeys, but better than the monkeys, since we are primates without tails. Uh, you look at the apes. Oh. So I go there. I look, look at the gorillas. I see resemblances between lots of my friends and relatives. No, 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 no. No, I, I, I really, no, I do. Um, you know, and the baboons, and no, that's, you know, that's closer to the monkey place, but uh, you look at the uh, gorillas. I've watched orangutans sort of hanging there, here. I love to watch orangutans. I'm sorry we don't have them living in Michigan. They won't. It's too cold for some odd reason. And so I watched them. But my favorite, of course, it was outlawed now by the new administration at the zoo. They shipped the elephants off to an old folks home somewhere in California. And they ended the chimp show. Do you remember the chimp show? Oh, I must say, I, I, most likely it was overwhelmingly cruel. But I liked it. And, uh, and watch the what? Watch the, chim, uh, the chimpanzees. Just watch them in their, uh, wherever they were. I used to be fascinated by their behavior. They also reminded me <laughs> you know, of lots of people, including myself, <laughs> that I knew. I mean, so, so, so there they are. So when Darwin was 
finished giving his statements, he got two major reactions. Uh, I mean, uh, one was, I hate it. They were called the fundamentalists, or whoever, they're still around, right? And they're very busy. They've taken over the school board in Kansas, so that's it. <laughs> and what I'm going to be giving you now, obviously, uh, most likely couldn't be presented <laughs> uh, uh, in the science classrooms of Kansas, I don't know, without some long apology. Uh, so we know about that group, the creationists, the intelligent design people, whatever. On the other side were the enthusiasts. But the enthusiasts were uncomfortable with the accusation that um, we were related to monkeys and apes. So they offered something that was very interesting. Uh, many of them designated themselves as political liberals. Um, political liberals were caught up in a problem. Their idea was that all human beings were in an almost unlimited fashion changeable. Whatever problems people had, it was because of education or environment. And if you changed, the, got it, the education and the environment, you could transform them. And on the left, that was a very big idea. So the idea that our feelings and our behavior are rooted in our animal past, uh -huh. they weren't very comfortable with that. So in fact, their approach to Darwin was, oh yes, he's absolutely right, absolutely right, absolutely right, absolutely right. But human beings are overwhelmingly unique. It may be that our body parts <laughs> are related to chimpanzees, and after all, genetics now emerged after Darwin, and genetics now has indicated that uh, the, the genes of chimpanzees and the genes of human beings, I mean, they're almost identical. So that bo that's body parts. But human behavior is a function of culture. Your culture determines your behavior. Well, that was an odd distinction to make, to say the least. I mean, I have two kinds of behavior. I have internal behavior and I have external behavior. Uh, liberals, on the whole, agreed that internal behavior was controlled by genes. My lungs behave. Right now they're back. It's behavior. My liver behaves. My intestines, I mean, there's all this behavior going on, right, of my internal organs. They're, yours are too. Are they controlled by culture? So that it seems like an arbitrary distinction to say that internal behavior is controlled by the genes, but external behavior, I mean, it's arbitrary. But external behavior is controlled by culture. Things have changed over the last 20 to 30 years dramatically. Uh, with the greater prominence of genetics, there's a greater awareness of our intimate connection to our evolutionary past. And it is very clear that our genes are not simply in control of the shape of our body, or not only control the internal behavior of our organs, but that they're also related to our external behavior. And since we share all these genes with chimpanzees and apes, it should be fairly clear that a lot of our behavior is shared with them. Oh. So, emerging now all these 
uh, people who study animal behavior are one of them is uh, this man called Franz de Waal. He's a Dutchman who made his way to Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, he's a professor of what we would call biology, ethology, and psychology altogether uh, at Emory University in Atlanta. And he's also uh, in charge of the Yerkes uh, Life Institute. I mean, it's a place where animals are kept so they can be observed. Uh, they have a large collection of what we call primates and of apes. And one of his jobs, or his main job, is to observe them. And then he goes traveling to places elsewhere, primarily in Africa, where they can be observed more closely. He has written five uh, significant books um, the, uh, one of them, The Ape and the Sushi Master, is wonderful. Uh, the other is Peacemaking Among Primates. That's also a wonderful one. Um, uh, Franz de Waal is, has become fairly famous. And because he focuses on what we call primates, he's called a primatologist in addition to, to all the other names that he has. And he has focused on two particular primates uh, and two particular apes. Uh, one is the chimpanzee, and the other one is one that wasn't discovered until the 1920s, uh, deep in the Congo rainforests. The two ways of pronouncing the name, it's B-O-N-O-B-O. -O -O. You can do bonobo or bonobo. I like bonobo, actually. And uh, so it looks like a champ chimpanzee. It smells like a chimpanzee, <laughs> but is very different in its behavior. Uh, you got it? Very different in its behavior from a chimpanzee. So, I mean, just as, you know, uh, genetically, you look at a chimpanzee, and genetically, you look at a human, I mean, it's almost identical, but obviously there are what? There are major, uh, major differences. So, in order to understand what Duval says, and I'll simply start out by saying, Duval does not accept the old liberal thesis that pervaded uh, this response to Darwin. The genes control our body, but they don't control our behavior. Change the culture, change the person. Gone. In fact, the genes that determine our body also determine our behavior, and even our emotions and our feelings. So if that is the case, then most likely if we go look at our nearest relatives evolutionarily, we're going to find the roots of our behavior. Now let me just give you some uh, background. Uh, the evolutionary process, well, uh, it is now imagined uh, that life emerged on, the, on this planet somewhere around four to four and a half billion years ago. Right? almost at the very beginning of the planet when the environment of the planet was uh, entirely different. For the first four billion years, most of the time, I mean, it would have been boring. The only life that existed were single-celled organisms. Got it? For four billion single-celled. So if you're sitting through the four billion years, I mean, you know, it's, you know it's, the, the change is slow. And then, boom, somewhere around, and it's recent time, somewhere around 650 million years ago, something happened. Was it a catastrophe? Did a meteor strike? I, who knows what happened? We don't know. 
a dramatic change occurred. All of a sudden, boom, we get what we call multi-celled organisms. This, boom. And when they, when they arrive, they arrive in all kinds of shapes and forms and whatever. Most of the innovation is eliminated. What generally prevails is a few set of forms. The most familiar form is the one we have. It's the reason we like symmetry. There's no reason why organisms have to be symmetrical, is there? <laughs> they just, we, we are, right? <laughs> Most organisms, you can just, what, cut them into, and you, you what, they are, they're symmetrical. In fact, I mean, we're now into what we call art with asymmetry. I, I, it's homework for me. <laughs> but I must tell you, emotionally, I'm more comfortable with, you know, if things are in order. I'm more comfortable with symmetry because it applies to where, uh, <laughs> where life is, the, the history of life. So that form emerged, and now these multi-celled organisms keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying, and then ultimately, uh, somewhere about a hundred million years after the process began, there emerges this model that we call a vertebrate. I mean, you got this mush, all these cells, glob. <laughs> so you now have to structure it. There are two structures that ultimately emerged. One is the corset structure. That's called an insect. You throw the blob inside, <laughs> and then you put a tight what? corset around it. <laughs> that's, that's an insect. All right. The other is to put the structure inside the blob <laughs> and prop it up. That's what we are, right? You, that's, it's, an internal, it's an internal skeleton. You, you stick the structure inside the blob because the blob is getting like bigger, <laughs> bigger, and you <laughs> give it a structure. And so there now emerge the vertebrates. And uh, the vertebrates develop, and certainly by the time we get to 250 million years ago, we're into the vertebrate world that kids love. I'm not sure they'd like to meet any of these creatures, but they certainly love talking about them. They're called dinosaurs. I mean, we now have uh, life that has come out of the water. That's vertebrate. And the age is dominated by these great reptiles. Now, toward the end of the age of the great reptiles, there emerged this little, little vertebrate that operated at night because during the day, the reptiles, the temperatures of which corresponded to the environment, right, were wide awake and they would have all been caught. Uh, so in order uh, to uh, survive, they had to develop constant body temperature so that they could survive not only in the day, but also uh, at night. What we call them now are mammals. What the first mammals looked like, I don't know. They were scurrying around trying to avoid the reptiles. And then 65 million years ago, was it another catastrophe? Was it a great meteor? Do I know? Was I there? I don't know. Boom! The great reptiles are destroyed. It's only 65 million years. When you think of four and a half bit, got it? Mm, a drop. 65 million years ago, they're, they're gone, and now these little things scurrying around take over. And the mammals ultimately will divide themselves into two kinds. One kind was prominent certainly in South America and Australia, and the others were prominent in North America. Europe, Africa, Asia. The ones in South America and Australia were called marsupials because the, the, the little mammals, when they emerged, uh, were placed in little pockets. I love kangaroos. But a little pocket <laughs> sticking out. And, some little, you know. right. and then the others are placentals like us, right? Uh, so uh, placental mammals ultimately uh, dominated, if you will, uh, the planet, and then they developed all kinds of forms. There were ungulates who were vegetarians, do you understand, like sheep and goats and cows and whatever. 
there were felines like cats. Uh, there were all these things that looked like wolves and dogs and those things that looked like elephants. I mean, the variety now moved, but there was one variety called primates. Uh, primates are most intimately related. They most likely came out of them, and that's our roots. That's why we use them in the laboratory all the time. We're related to rats, who are very smart. When you tell people they're related to rats, they just... <laughs> It, 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 no, no, it, it, you can't. If you say eagles, oh, eagles, oh, rats. But no, no, we, uh, we most likely are. There, there are the rodents, and out of the road, there, there was a, a rodent that ultimately ended up in the trees. There may have been a common ancestor to the rodents and the primates, who knows what. The point is, our origin is trees. If you want to understand us, it's trees. We're up in the trees, and now survival in the tree. Well, first of all, you have to go from branch to branch, because if you crawl down to the ground to go up another tree, you're going to be caught by another animal, you know, gulp, gulp, chew, chew. So that's it. So you now have to swing from branch to branch. In order to do that, the two characteristics that characterize primates uh, appear. One is vision. The primary sense for primates is seeing. Our smell isn't as good as dogs, our hearing isn't as good as dogs, but our vision is certainly better. Vision is our strongest sense because if you're jumping You better make the next branch. <laughs> so ultimately, to improve the vi what happened through natural selection was to improve the vision, the eyes were on the side. They came around to the front, and what was created is the face. It's, we have it, apes have it, monkeys have it. That's why we love them, because they have a face. I mean, dogs have a face, but they have the big thing, canine teeth. <laughs> doesn't look the same, the snout sticking out there and the eyes on the side. Uh, what happens to us is the snout gets pushed in, do you the eyes come together and out of it comes the face. The face is related to going from branch to branch. You've got, you got to see where you are going. And in addition, the forelimbs, which are normally used like on a cow or a sheep, just you know, move along, the forelimbs now become the way you ooh, because vision alone won't, <laughs> won't do it. You, you need the two. So now something else happens that will ultimately produce the kinds of hands that we, that we have, that chimpanzees have, that apes have. Uh, so we're heading for the branch. So we were tree people. It's hard for us to uh, know that because uh, somewhere around five million years ago, uh, through various kinds of catastrophes, there was an incredible drought in Africa, and in fact, large parts of the forest disappeared, and many of the primates were thrown down to the ground, the ones that survived living not in trees, you're looking at. That's when we learned to walk. So, the primates, there is a, a chain. And what happens is off, just think of it, moves on, and off of it branch off the what? The various animals, the, 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 the different roots. That's what, what evolution is. So now I got this primate tree. The first branch, I don't know, somewhere around 14 million years ago is the orangutan goes off on his own. Then going up somewhere around seven and a half million years ago, the gorilla. All right? And now I, the thing that I have are a very interesting tree because it's a special part of the primate tree. 
because initially when the primate tree started, uh, almost all primates had tails because that was another way to what? To make it. So then uh, branching off is the ape. And now I've got the ape thing, and the ape thing, the orangutan, and then seven and a half million years ago, the gorilla, and then somewhere around five million years ago, we broke off, it's called humans, and the chimp thing is still going on, and then about two and a half million years ago from the chimps, are these bonobos, bonobos, whatever you want to call them, right? Got this whole thing? In terms of evolutionary time, it isn't very long. In terms of human lifespan, it is overwhelmingly long ago. So now, Franz de Waal wants to look at these two closest relatives. How do you find one? Well, the chimpanzees live generally in the rainforests, as the gorillas do, of Africa. Orangutans are to be found in Indonesia, that, that area. But they live in the rainforests of Africa. The bonobos, they live, well, they live in the Congo. Uh, uh, on one side of the Congo River are the chimpanzees, and on the other side of the Congo River are the bonobos. And they're different in their appearance. In fact, he talks about that. Uh, the chimpanzees are short, given human height, but don't tangle with them. And uh, they tend to be stocky. <coughs> the bonobos are much thinner. Uh, they have longer legs, they're thinner, and they have this strange haircut. When you see them, I'm just that they're just. It's adorable. I don't know who does it. It's like a hairdresser comes in. <laughs> it's like a part right here, and it's sort of parted, like the hair is sort of parted in the middle, and you look at them, and they just look so human. And in fact, hang on to them, because obviously there are all kinds of questions that uh, Franz de Waal asks when he watches these animals. One of the questions is, is it true, as so many people claimed, yes, we are all descended from these people, whatever, or these animals, whatever, but certainly ethics is human. Are there any signs of what we would call ethical behavior? Huh? Uh, social organization, human politics, oh, that's, that's culture, 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 culture. Uh, politics, after all, is the way groups are organized. Because one of the things that happened among the primates, since they were highly vulnerable, is that they compensated for their vulnerability by organizing themselves into groups. We call that societies, right? Living together. So they have, they have to have a political structure. All groups have a political structure. You watch wild dogs running around the street, they got a what? Together they got a political structure. There's one dog that may be dominant. So are our political structures related? Can, do, we, do we have any reflection in that? So we're looking for ourselves. That's the whole, got the whole thing? We're looking for ourselves. So we're going to start with the chimps. Uh, and the first thing we know about the chimps is, and I'm going to read to you from him, his words. Uh, it's down here somewhere, my glasses. If I can get under the tape. There we are. All right. Uh, the first thing we know about the chimps is they live in societies, and the societies are hierarchically organized. That is, there are dominant chimps and non-dominant chimps. So let me read to you the, the words that he gives to uh, chimpdom. Uh, Among chimpanzees, hierarchy permeates everything. 
when we bring two females inside the building, as we often do for testing, and have them work on the same task, one will be ready to go while the other hangs back. This is the, the second female barely dares to take rewards and won't touch the puzzle box, computer, or whatever else we're using in the experiment. She may be just as eager as the other, but defers always to her superior. There is no tension or hostility, and out in the group they may be the best of friends. One female simply dominates the other. And not only do, uh, that happen, does that happen among the females, it happens among the males. There is a social order. So if we go back in time to our closest relatives, what we discover politically is that it's not democratic. Because one of the big uh, questions always was, how did society begin? The story that was presented by John Locke, who was one of the inspirers of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson used him, was to say that when society began, all people were equal. And later on, they decided that was too dangerous, so they made a pact. And in the pact, they accepted government and they accepted superiors and inferiors in order to achieve their safety. But hang on to this. If we go back to these animals, you can't find no domination and no dominance built into the very system. All right? The second thing is that so there are two genders, male and female. There's no doubt about it with the chimps. The males are dominant. Uh, females among themselves may create their own hierarchy, but females are dominated by, uh, by males. And in fact, uh, there are two agendas that relate to it. If the fundamental drive of life is survival, and the primary strategy of survival since individual organisms die, if the fundamental strategy of survival is reproduction, then every organism seeks to maximize its reproductive capacity. So men and women, or males and females, have different agendas. The agenda of, ma of a male is to spread his sperm around as much as possible. So he wishes to impregnate as many females as he can. That's the strategy. So for men, therefore, the thing that the, the males want is to collect as many females as possible. Because all he has to do is impregnate. Among mammals, the primary parent is the mother, because she's left with the uh, Baby, she has a different strategy. Women, once impregnated, then give birth to a child that needs to be raised. She needs food for herself and for her child. So she's not looking for continuous uh, sexual encounters on the whole. She's looking for a male who most likely is handsome and looks good and will give her good and strong offspring and simultaneously take care of her. So now the agendas are different. The males need to dominate the females to accumulate as many as possible. They are highly competitive. The females wish to be acquired and attached to uh, males that will protect them and feed them, and their competition arises among the women who are acquired by a single a dominant male. Now this strategy appears in other organisms and other mammals, different from the chimpanzees, but it is there. And so now let me uh, share with you what he, uh, what he says. Uh, the advantage of high rank must be pretty enormous, otherwise evolution would never have installed such foolhardy ambitions. Uh, they are ubiquitous in the animal kingdom, from frogs and rats to chickens and elephants. High rank generally translates into food for females and mates for males. 
I say generally because males also compete for food and females for mates, even though the latter is mostly restricted to species like ours. Everything in evolution boils down to reproductive success, which means that the different orientations of males and females make perfect sense. A male can increase his progeny by mating with many females while keeping rivals away. For the female, such a strategy makes no sense. Mating with multiple males generally does not do her any good. The female goes for quality rather than quantity. <laughs> Males go for quantity rather than quality. Right. Most female animals do not live with their mates, hence all they need to do is pick the most vigorous and healthy sex partner. This way their offspring will be blessed with good genes. But females of species in which the mates stay around are in a different situation, which makes them favor males who are gentle, protective, and good providers. So now, so now you win the race. You're in this chimpanzee group and you have control of most of the females, or a large number of them. Uh, in order to achieve the power, you have allies because you need allies. And the allies also have access to the females, and then scurrying around the corner are the what? The losers. <laughs> the, they're the males who can't, uh, who, who can't acquire anything. Now, one of the very interesting things that was discovered by Duval is that there's a price for male domination. Let me read it to you. The fates that may befall those at the top are an inevitable part of the power drive. Apart from the risk of injury or death, because you're fighting with the other males, being in a position of power is stressful. This can be demonstrated by measuring cortisol, a stress hormone in the blood. It is no easy task to do so in wild animals, but Robert Sapolsky has been darting male baboons on the African plains for years. Among these highly competitive primates, cortisol levels depend on how good an individual is at managing social tensions. As in humans, this turns out to be a matter of personality. Some dominant males have high stress levels, hmm. simply because they cannot tell the difference between a serious challenge and neutral behavior they shouldn't worry about. They are jumpy and paranoid. After all, if a rival walks by, it could be just because he needs to go from A to B, not because he wants to be a nuisance. And when the hierarchy is in flux, misunderstandings accumulate, wrecking the nerves of males near the top. So one of the prices of male domination is what? High stress. Males suffer, or dominant males suffer from high stress. Not all of them. There is something which is not anthropological, I mean, I mean which is not primatological language. Cool. You know, there, there are cool chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, they, they, they're not, they're dominant and they're cool and they make it, but most likely two thirds of them suffer from high stress and are, uh, and are paranoid. Now, the third characteristic, there have been two views of chimpanzees. The early view of the chimpanzee was, oh, why can't we be like the chimpanzees? They just eat leaves. <laughs> no, 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 no. They live in the forest and they all are very nice to each other and we have violence and we have war, which was created by human culture. Wrong. Chimpanzee society is very violent. And so now I'm going to read to you just a little bit about the violence. So it's uh, very, very interesting because we sometimes think the roots of war lie in human culture. I know all, all, all these people uh, who are pacifists who say human beings are essentially what? Peaceful. It's just culture that's turned us into these uh, warlike, uh, warlike beings. Well, here are our closest evolutionary relatives. All right. Peddling up one of the rare hills of my native Holland, I was bracing myself for the gruesome sight awaiting me at the Arnhem Zoo. In the early morning, I had received a call telling me that my favorite male chimpanzee, Lewitt, had been butchered by his own kind. Apes can inflict incredible damage with their powerful canine teeth. Most of the time, they are just trying to intimidate each other with what we call bluff displays, but occasionally the bluff is backed up by action. I had left the zoo the previous day worrying about Lewitt, but I was totally unprepared for what I found. Normally proud and not particularly affectionate to people, Lewitt now wanted to be touched. 
He was sitting in a pool of blood, his head leaning against the bars of the night cage, and when I gently stroked him, he let out the deepest sigh. Bonding at last, but at the saddest moment of my career as a primatologist, it was immediately obvious that Lewis' condition was life-threatening. He still moved about, but had lost enormous amounts of blood. He had deep puncture holes all over his body and had lost fingers and toes, and we soon discovered that he was missing even more vital parts. I have come to think of this moment in which Lewitt looked to me for comfort as an allegory of modern humanity. Like violent apes covered in our own blood, we long for reassurance. Despite our tendency to maim and kill, we also want to hear that everything will be all right. And at the time, however, I was focused only on trying to save Lewitt's life. As soon as the vet arrived, we tranquilized Lewitt and took him into surgery, where we sewed literally hundreds of stitches. It was during this desperate operation that we discovered that Lewitt's testicles were gone. They were bitten off. They had disappeared from the scrotal sac, even though the holes in the skin seemed smaller than the testicles themselves, which the keepers had found lying in the straw on the cage floor. They mean business. So all those cute little chimps on the bicycles <laughs> that you saw at the zoo, I want to tell you. They mean business. Uh, violence also means that they are carnivorous. I always thought of them as sort of, you know, vegetarian. It was always comforting to think they were, even though we're not. I mean, we are, we make a deliberate effort. Right. Uh, the next day I saw a female walk by with a jockey riding juvenile on her back. The daughter happily swung something fluffy in the air, which turned out to have belonged to the poor monkey. One primate's tail is another's toy. <laughs> Even though chimps survive mainly on fruits and leaves, they're far more carnivorous than was once thought. They eat over 35 different species of vertebrates. The daily meat intake per adult chimpanzee during good times approaches that of the human hunter-gatherer during bad times. Chimps are so keen on meat, in fact, that our cook had trouble bringing a live duck from the village to camp so as to give us a break from our beans and rice diet. On his way, he encountered a female chimp intent on appropriating the precious bird he was holding under his arm. The brave cook withstood her threats, but just barely. Had he encountered a male chimp, he would never have gotten to taste the duck. This becomes serious if the meal is human. Having grown up during the heyday of research, Frodo, a chimpanzee at nearby Gombe National Park, has lost all fear of people. He occasionally attacks researchers, hitting them or dragging them down a slope. He's one-third the size. But the worst incident involved a local woman, her baby and her niece. The niece carried the woman's 14-month-old baby. They were crossing a small gully when they ran into Frodo, who was feeding on oil palm fronds. When the ape turned around, it was too late to run. Frodo simply plucked the baby off the girl's back and disappeared. Later, he was found eating the baby, who by now was dead. So we, you know, we're always amazed by cannibalism. Well, cannibalism is culture. Chimps eat chimps, they eat monkeys, and they will eat humans. So we want to understand ourselves. Do you understand? <laughs> uh, it isn't that we all started out as lovely little primates eating fruits and veggies. And then all of a sudden, culture, horrible human culture, turned us into warlike monsters. We are essentially and basically peaceful. Got it? Those are our, those are our relatives. And I used to see the chimp show at the zoo, and they didn't seem to do that. Maybe they, I don't know, maybe they lost a few trainers. <laughs> no, no, uh, along, along the way, that didn't seem. Now we come to sex, which is certainly a primary human activity, because otherwise, reproduction will not take place. So uh, one of the interesting things, uh, let me turn to chimps and sex. Here we are. Sex for food deals are known with chimps. Robert Yerke is one of the pioneers of primatology, after whom the center that uh, Duval is the head of, or was named, conducted experiments on what he called conjugal relations. 
After dropping a peanut between a male and a female, he would note that a swollen female's privileges exceeded those of females without such a bartering tool. Female chimps with swellings, ready for sexual activity, invariably claim the prize. In nature, hunting episodes are often followed by meat sharing with swollen females. In fact, when such females are around, males may hunt more avidly because of the sexual opportunities. A low-ranking male who captures a colobus monkey automatically becomes a magnet for the opposite sex, offering him a chance to mate for meat. That's a, that's a great line. To mate for meat. <laughs> to mate for meat until he's found out by someone higher ranking uh, than himself. So obviously, uh, the male she chooses, I mean, now it's providing food. It could also be providing more, ultimately, uh, as primates evolve. There is an exchange. Females are not interested in males who cannot provide them with anything. And males are not interested in females who cannot provide them with sex. Uh, so, that, I mean, that's, that's the, that becomes the basis of the connection. Now, what he discovered and is very important is that they're all living together in a society. It's a group. And in fact, there are fights and lots of violence. Uh, sexual activity among uh, chimps is not overwhelmingly great. I mean, the women are all what held by the the few dominant uh, the few dominant chimps. And in fact, the sexual organs of the males are small. Uh, they do not have to provide a lot of sperm because they have no difficulty figuring out that their offspring is indeed the what? Their offspring, because they, the, uh, the women aren't available to other, uh, to other men. Women that have multiple sexual encounters, you cannot tell paternity, unless you have a DNA machine somewhere. Now, chimp society is, uh, well, he here we are. Um, in terms of cooperation, uh, let me turn back here. Um, yes, 136. Okay. Here, both humans and chimps are gentle or at least restrained toward members of their own group, yet both can be monsters to those on the outside. I'm simplifying, of course, because chimps can also kill within their own community, as can people, especially males competing for females. But the in-group versus the out-group distinction is fundamental when it comes to love and hate. This is true also for captive apes. So now, this is a characteristic, and remember it when we try to draw the implications for humans. Chimps learn to be cooperative with the people in their group because their survival depends on it. There are internal fights all the time and internal competitions, and everybody has a place in the hierarchy. You're either dumping or being dumped on, but almost everybody is being dumped on and dumping simultaneously. But you have to have some levels of reconciliation because otherwise what? The society won't, won't work. So there is kindness. If there isn't a competitive situation, chimps will show kindness to members of their own group. What they won't do is show any kindness to members of what? Other groups. Which is strangers. So, the ethical rule is very clear. Kindness and cooperation for the people or for the chimps inside. Hatred and hostility, murder for those outside. Now that's wired into chimp genes. So think about that because he, reflect on human behavior. We're going to come back to it. Just reflect on human behavior. One of the problems we have in the world, and by the way, uh, I had it in my own neighborhood, you know. When I was growing up in my neighborhood, there were people who were wonderful neighbors. They, if you were sick, they would come over to help you. 
If you needed food, they would bring food to you. If you wanted help cutting your lawn, that was all right. You were part of their group. But when they spoke about blacks and others, their language was absolutely murderous. There was the in-group, there was the what? The out-group. And for the out-group, there was nothing. No kindness, no cooperation, no sharing, only for the in-group. The fear and hatred of strangers is not something determined by human culture. I, I cannot tell you how many people have told me. People basically would all love each other if we remove the cultural barriers. Not true. Uh, the fear of strangers, do you understand? Is very deeply rooted in the genetic history of, of primates. So now he turns to this other group, by the way, the bonobos did not separate from the chimps until after the humans did. The chimps went off and the humans went here, and the bonobos didn't split from the chimps until about two and a half million years ago. And by that time, Africa had a lot of hominoids. Have you ever seen a bonobo? Oh. Well, uh, bonobos are compared to chimps, long-legged. Uh, they're much thinner, and they've got this interesting haircut, all right? Otherwise, they pretty much resemble uh, the chimpanzee. And now, their behavior, and this now, what's the root? We, we split off from the, what we call the line when there was an ancestor to both chimps and bonobos. So maybe some of what is inside of us is related not only to chimps, but also to bonobos. So now let me tell you about bonobos, because their behavior is totally different. All right. First of all, there is hierarchy in bonobos, but not a lot. It's basically a kind of egalitarian society. The second thing about bonobos, which is so startling, chimps are heavily male-dominated. The gender, if there is any kind of domination, that dominates in bonobo society are females. So I, I give you, do you, do you understand? So that's, so, so that's another what? That's another wing, right? So um, after all, our genes come from the common ancestor of both chimps and, uh, and bonobos. So let me read to you about the, the behavior of females. All right, here we are. First, what's so good about being a male bonobo? For one thing, the male-female ratio among adults in the wild is almost one to one. That resembles humans. In, t in terms of reproduction, it's one to one. In the in the chimps and others, it's th there's a, a, a much greater discrepancy. First of all, there are far fewer males, for two reasons: there isn't an equal one to one, and two, half the males are killed <laughs> in the process of competing. They're, they're they're just eliminated. But in bonobo society, it's like one to one. So if all you're interested in is a little sex, <laughs> uh, it's, it's one to one. Even the losers, <laughs> e e yeah, I mean, even the peripherals, uh, whatever it else, uh, gets a, a chance. Since both species, um, chimps and bonobos, have a one to one sex ratio of birth, and since there are no roaming males outside the community, chimp males must suffer extraordinary mortality. This is hardly surprising, given the intercommunity warfare of this species. So there isn't the internal warfare. Why? How do they get rid of this violence? Well, I hesitate to do this. Now, I'm going to do this because the behavior of bonobos is just, 
it's hard to describe in public. So I'm going to be <laughs> as dis will, will, will you bear with me? No, I'm, no, no, I mean, because I, 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 I don't know how else to do it. It's, it's, it's fascinating, but it's, uh, you know, you don't do it in polite company. You don't do what they do in polite company. I mean, and you can't even talk about it in polite company. So will you bear with me? All right, good. If you titter from time to time, it's all right. I don't, uh, <laughs> it's okay. So now let me talk about uh, why women have a chance uh, for control uh, and why the violence is low. After all, in the chimp society, the males want to know or are able to know their own offspring. Very clear. You corner the market on females, right? You possess them, you intimidate other males if they try to get near when, uh, are there illicit affairs going on in shim societies? Of course. <laughs> but I mean, you, you can only control so much, but you try to control it. So, you can be pretty sure that the offspring of the female who is attached to you is your offspring, and therefore you can invest energy in it. I do want to tell you something about chimps. When chimps defeat another dominant male, one dominant male defeats another and acquires the harem, he will kill all the babies because those babies are not his babies. Kill them, called infanticide. Just kill them. They're not his. He's not going to invest his energy in feeding them. Do you understand? Uh, whatever. No. There are exceptions, but on the whole, that's what happens. The only way to avoid it is for females to be promiscuous. If females are promiscuous, Uh, they're sexed up all the time, and they're available all the time, and in fact they have multiple relations with multiple males, then nobody knows <laughs> whose nobody knows whose whose child it is. So there's no reason. Uh, in such a society, the men don't corner the females because the females are simply what? Re readily available, and in fact, they can't worry about paternity since you, d you can't figure out paternity. So Bonobo society is a society of absolute, all the time, continuous, free sex. That's not a chimp society. That is a uh, bonobo society, but it's a society in which females have power and in which levels of violence are way down. All right, so, so now let me uh, give you an idea of. When we clean up around our house, we find leftover pesticides and batteries and antifreeze and gasoline and paint thinner and used motor oil. Whew. But did you know that our rivers and lakes become polluted if these materials are dumped or washed into a storm drain or ditch? Remember, storm drains lead straight to our rivers and lakes. Help keep our water safe and clean. Dispose of hazardous materials at your community collection site and use less toxic alternatives when possible. Together we can keep our water clean. It's our water, our future, ours to protect. Let me uh, give you an idea about sex life in Bonobo uh, society. All right, here we are. Um, this is what they do, and I'm going to read this to you. And there's other stuff I'm not going to read to you, but I'm going to read this to you. Okay. 
and, and, and if it disturbs you overwhelmingly, then, you know, I either put something in your ear or uh, you, you can, ex I mean, whatever. But I don't think it'd be Bob Dart. The tongue kiss, which the English language blames on the French, <laughs> is an act of total trust. The tongue is one of our most sensitive organs, and the mouth is the body cavity that can do it the quickest harm. The act permits us to savor another. But at the same time, we exchange saliva, bacteria, viruses, and food. Yes, food. In modern times, we may think of teenagers swapping chewing gum. They do that. <laughs> they do it. But the mouth kiss is thought to originate from maternal feeding of the young. A bird's, you know, you, 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 you force the food down the, the mouth. And mother apes do indeed pass morsels of chewed food onto their offspring from stuck out lower lip into open baby mouth. This is, of course, where the tongue comes in. The French kiss is the bonobo's most recognizable human-like erotic act. Whenever I show an undergraduate class the film of my bonobos, the students get very quiet. <laughs> they will watch all sorts of sexual intercourse, but invariably the deepest impression is made by a video clip of two juvenile males tongue kissing. Even though one can never be sure exactly what goes on, it looks so ardent, so deep with wide open mouths placed on each other that it takes my students by surprise. No Hollywood actor can match the zeal these juvenile apes put into the act. <laughs> and the funny thing is that they will proceed seamlessly to a mock fight or burst into a playful chase, for Bonobo's erotic contact mixes freely with everything else they do. They can move quickly from eating to sex, from sex to play, from grooming to a kiss, and so on. In fact, I have seen females continue collecting food while being mounted by a male. Bonobos take sex seriously, but never to the same degree as a lecture hall full of college students. <laughs> <laughs> is, that a, is that a great, no, no, is that a great line? No, no, they're just, so, uh, so the purpose of sex, obviously, uh, is not only for reproduction, uh, now that it's freely distributed, it, it's a way of bonding in the society. Bonding not only between males and females, but between males and males, and females and females, and the whole thing, I mean, just goes on. In fact, um, he, he talks about, uh, in the society, they refer to, uh, to homosexuality. Yeah, he says, it, uh, there's nobody who is exclusively homosexual in a, in a bonobo uh, society. But everybody does, doesn't? Both. Some do hetero almost all the time. Some do a mixture, whatever. It is simply a way of uh, bonding. Sometimes you'll see monkeys. They have a bonding activity. It's called grooming. Sometimes people will do that for me. Nice people here, they'll say, oh, there's a spot. There is. <laughs> Or there's something, you know, and the people will come up to you and they'll, no, they, they, and it's very nice. It's, it's a very, it's, it's like touching and, and it's a very affectionate kind. No, we, we all do it. Grooming, mutual grooming is, is part of, the, uh, of this world. So, this is a world with minimal violence. And the minimal violence is due to free <laughs> and available sex. And in fact, since they're doing sex all the time, their sexual organs have to be, the male sexual organs, and even the female, have uh, enormous. The, they're on all the time. Because for males, they have to store enormous amounts of sperm just to be sociable. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that also amazed his students. He talked, that also amazed his students. I mean, give me a break. I mean, the, uh, so. Uh, I have no slides for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, no slides for this. Are you getting the feeling for a bone? Now, it's very different from, is it not very different from chimp society? And since we broke off from the ancestor of both chimps and bonobos, we, uh, we don't know what genes, you know, uh, uh, ended up. We, we could have gotten some of that chimp stuff, and we certainly did from some of our behavior. We may have gotten some of that bonobo stuff. So, uh, well, there is in a Bonobo society extraordinary cooperation. So let me just, and kindness, uh, and it's all reinforced, it's rather interesting. 
It's reinforced by this touching and whatever, uh, which may turn into what we call sexual activity, but we come out of a cultural world in which that activity is viewed as being very dangerous. So you can't distribute it freely, but not in uh, the world of the, of the bonobos. So now let me read to you about the cooperation, uh, talking about ethical activity. Peaceful mingling between bonobo groups was first noted in the 1980s when different communities came together in the Wamba Forest in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So there's the Congo River. The Congo River runs sort of in a kind of, or flows in a southwesterly fashion. So on the east side of the Congo are the chimps, and on the west side of the Congo, in the Demo what today is called the Democratic Republic of the, there are two republics now called the Congo. They used to be Zaire on the east side and the Congo on the west side. And then after Mobutu was overthrown in Zaire, they renamed it the Congo. So he got two countries called the Congo. It's like having two states called Michigan. It's a little confusing. Anyway, uh, they're in the Wamba Forest. In case you get to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I would wait a little bit. It's not too peaceful there now. <laughs> this may hardly seem spectacular, but the event was as shocking as the violence among former chimpanzee friends in Gombe. It countered the persistent belief that our lineage is naturally violent. Uh, by the way, uh, when bonobos run into other bonobo groups, uh, they'll often just rub them and have sex with them and whatever else. I mean, do, do you understand? It's, uh, the, the, it's not the, the chimps. <laughs> if I see a chimp, I'm going to run now. After I read this book, <laughs> finished. <laughs> I'm running. But not with, uh, with, not with the bonobo. So uh, they, they mingle, uh, they're, far more, they're far more friendly. And again, uh, what we see, and this is very significant, what we see is that we have two organisms, two relatives, with s strangely, or not strangely, different behavior, each of which may have genes that contributed to the human condition. So you got the chimps, got the bonobos? All right, now's the big question, the, the question at the very beginning. The big question is, so what does it have to do with us? What does it tell us about what human behavior is like, the roots of human behavior, and what the limitations of change are? Because in the end, you have to live with the reality of our makeup. You can't invent an ideal human being and then say, oh, that's what he is. It's all culture. You have to live with what we are because inside each of ourselves is a program. Do you understand? And a large part of that program is also in chimps and bonobos. So what does it mean for us? If you want to understand your behavior better, please come back <laughs> in five minutes. Thank you very much. Well, we have the question, and uh, the question is, what does it have to do with us? Well, if you believe in evolution, it has a lot, because we can see some of the roots of human behavior uh, in the behavior of both the chimps and the, and the bonobos. Uh, all three of us. Uh, share a common ancestor. On that ape tree, uh, we split off from the common ancestor of the chimps and the bonobos, and then the bonobos split off from the, uh, from the chimps. So what are the implications of this? Well, the first is, um, and we're becoming more and more aware of this, uh, the roots of our external behavior uh, lie not only in uh, culture, they also lie in our genetic and evolutionary background. And if we un want to understand who and what we are and what we need to do uh, to either indulge or control 
our desires and feelings, then we have to understand that past. The second is to understand that human beings took a special turn that differs from that of the chimps and the bonobos. Uh, it was a way of ensuring uh, the survival of the young. Uh, because in both chimp and bonobo society, the males have very little to do with the raising of the offspring. I mean, they're there. Uh, they can be kind, they can bring food, whatever else it is. But they're not intimately involved. But in humans, men are. And that's why sex is a threatening subject uh, in human society. So let me read to you first what uh, Duval has to say, and then I will comment on it. Most human societies limit sex to a few partners. Polygamy may be practiced and accepted, but in reality, the vast majority of families in the world include only one man and one woman. Right? So there's no free sex. Uh, nobody has found a human society in which that exists. Margaret Mead fantasized, because her research was inadequate, Margaret Mead fantasized that she had found something like that in the in the South Pacific somewhere, without music. Okay, so the, uh, <laughs> but she, her research was, uh, was off. Uh, she wanted to find it, and so she found it. It's, it's not human behavior. So, um, the nuclear family is the hallmark of human social evolution. Given the exclusivity of our sexual context, we've opted for the opposite of the bonobo plan by actually enhancing a male's ability to tell which offspring are his. Um, until modern science came along, men could never be sure, but had a f far better chance of guessing right than a bonobo does. <laughs> right? Uh, because we now have an institution called marriage. Uh, the, uh, the history of marriage, uh, of this partnering, was for men to know for sure. And obviously, human society um, has featured male domination for most of its, uh, of its history. Um, to enable men to be sure that their offspring is theirs. Uh, so then, in this scary place, females with young were the most vulnerable. So you have to understand, um, why didn't they simply move to a uh, chimp model? Um, well, that wasn't possible because humans don't live in trees. They live on the ground. And in fact, they found themselves after an incredible drought when the forest dried up. They found themselves in the vast plains of what we call the savanna. The word we would use in North America is the prairie. So here they are. They don't have big teeth. They don't have big claws, do you understand? And now there are these huge mammals running around on the savanna. They are very vulnerable. So now you're a female and you have a baby. In this scary place, females with young were the most vulnerable, unable to outrun predators. They could never have ventured far away from the forest without male protection. Perhaps bands of agile males defended the group and helped carry juveniles to safety during emergencies. This would never have worked, though, if we'd kept the chink or bonobo social system. Promiscuous males are simply not good at commitment. 
I mean, I don't want to denounce chimps, but that, uh, you know, you no, know, they're not very good at it. That's it. Okay. Without hope to single out their progeny, they have little reason to invest in childcare. To get the males involved, society would have had to change. Human social organization is characterized by a unique combination of male bonding, which of course is done for the hunting, female bonding, and nuclear families. We share the first with chimpanzees, <coughs> the second with bonobos, and the third is ours alone. It's no accident that people everywhere fall in love, are sexually jealous, no shame, seek privacy, look for father figures in addition to mother figures, and value stable partnerships. The intimate male-female relationship implied in all of this, which zoologists have dubbed a pair bond, is bred into our bones. I believe this is what sets us apart from the other apes more than anything else. Even Malinowski's hedonistic savages were not without a tendency to form exclusive households in which both males and females cared for children. Our species social order revolves around this model, which gave our ancestors a foundation for building cooperative societies to which both sexes contributed and in which both felt secure. So, if now, if you want to guarantee that to know who your offspring is, then you're going to have to invest a lot of time and energy because you're down on the what? The savanna grass and there are all these predators. So you're being able to handle, you know, 12 women and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, 46 kids is what? Uh, is limited. Ultimately, you may, if you have power, you might settle for three or four. But most settle for what? It's one on one. And in fact, uh, that provides the female with security and protection. It provides the child with what? Security and protection. It provides the father with assurance that the child he is rearing is related, although he wouldn't have used the word then, is related genetically to him. Okay. So both sides get something. And out of it, on the savanna grass, emerges a social arrangement different from that of the chimps and different from that of the bonobos. Uh, so that, that is, by the way, a major and significant difference. And actually, through natural selection over several million years, most likely that form of social arrangement is built not only into our culture, it's also built into our genes, so the, their, the compulsion for, uh, for partnering, and also the pleasure that men take in parenting. It's not clear that male chimps take a lot of pleasure in parenting, and it's not clear the bonobo males, do you understand, take a lot of pleasure uh, in, in parenting. Uh, in fact, uh, there are sexual liaisons between older males, younger females, the, the, the whole thing. Uh, and sometimes even the reverse. Now, the third thing, and very important, and certainly we get this from uh, maybe our chimp ancestry or the shared ancestor of the, both the chimps and us, it's called hierarchy. The political structure of human society everywhere in the world has historically been hierarchical. There are dominant people and there are those who are not. What we call democracy um, is a modified form of hierarchy. But I do want to tell you that total totally equality generally doesn't work, and let me give you an example. In the 1970s, when the rage of the 60s was all the way through, the, there was an idea that was circulated in the educational system in the Detroit area, and you may have heard about it, that in fact we, what we need to do is establish equality between teachers and students. And in Troy, for instance, at Troy High School, where I went to give a talk, uh, students were allowed to choose the classes they wanted, 
and if they weren't happy in a class where they were sitting to pick themselves up and walk out. So you, you cannot imagine the chaos. Do you understand? Can you imagine the chaos? Can you imagine the chaos? The point is, um, we live in a hierarchical society. The model is to be found in the nuclear family in which children, hopefully, and parents do not have equal power. And in fact, even democratic societies are organized with governments in which some people have more power than others. Because a society with no hierarchy of any kind most likely can't, uh, can't function. So uh, let me read to you uh, the words of Duval here. Likewise, watching a group of people, one will quickly notice which individuals act with the greatest confidence, attract the most glances and nods of agreement, are least reluctant to break into the discussion, speak in a softer voice, yet expect everybody to listen and laugh at their jokes, voice unilateral opinions, and so on. But there are far more subtle status clues. Scientists used to consider the frequency band of 500 hertz and below in the human voice as meaningless noise. Because when a voice is filtered, removing all higher frequencies, one hears nothing but a low-pitched hum. All words are lost. But then it was found that this low hum is an unconscious social instrument. It is different for each person, but in the course of a conversation, people tend to converge. They settle on a single hum. And it is always the lower status person who does the adjusting. The lower status person always adjusts to the hum of the dominant person in the conversation. This was first demonstrated in an analysis of the Larry King live television show. The host, Larry King, would adjust his timbre to that of high-ranking guests, like Mike Wallace or Elizabeth Taylor. Low-ranking guests, on the other hand, would adjust their timbre to that of the King, the clear to that of King. The clearest adjustment to King's voice, indicating lack of confidence, came from former Vice President Dan Quayle. Anybody who's a teacher knows that. You walk into a class and you know there are three kids that control it. And if you don't control them, you have no control of the class. So they, they get their signal. There's, a, there's always a, like a dominant. It's in some classes, there's one dominant person. It's a he or a she sometimes. And they give the signals to all the other kids. And if you don't know who that dominant person is, you, you, can't, you can't possibly, uh, and dominate that person, you can't possibly establish control over the, the class. It happens even in families. And sometimes the dominant person isn't mama or papa. Uh, I've walked into lots of houses. Uh, and uh, I see do dominance behavior. Dominance behavior is just uh, natural. Uh, to, uh, to primates, and in fact, uh, so we have hierarchy. It's an integral part of what we do. Now, the, one of the things about hierarchy, and uh, he talks about it with regard to chimps, so let me just go back to chimps for a moment and tell you about this behavior, okay? Um, Every society has scapegoats, but the most extreme cases I have known, this is uh, uh, the, the chimps, it's uh, other primates called macaques, monkeys. I have known concerned newly established groups of macaques. These monkeys have strict hierarchies, and while the higher-ups were working out their rank positions, a process that tends to get nasty, nothing was easier for them than to turn en masse against a poor bottom ranker. One female named Black got attacked so often that we called the corner she used to flee to Black's Corner. Black would crouch there while the rest of the group gathered round her, mostly grunting and threatening, but sometimes biting or pulling out fistfuls of hair, like the runt of the, of the breed. In my experience of managing primates, there's no point in giving in to the temptation of removing the scapegoat. The next day, another individual will take its place. There is an obvious need for a receptacle of tensions. But when Black gave birth to her first offspring, everything changed because the alpha male protected this infant. Uh, so built into chimp society are scapegoats. And if you try to remove the scapegoat, they will create 
another. It's called dumping. If the alpha male dumps on, do you understand, the beta male, the beta male will dump on the gamma male, I mean, whatever, whatever. Uh, and the worst thing is to be in the position where you can't dump, that's, the, the, that's Black's position, uh, where you can't dump on anybody. We have that in human relations. The boss hollers at the employee. The employee comes home and hollers at his wife. <laughs> no, 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 and children. So, part of the hierarchical arrangement is scapegoats, and part of human society, I must say. If you look at the history of human beings, in almost all cultures, uh, every group finds the scapegoat. I mean, I was just in the South, and the history of the South is very interesting. There was the ruling class, and below them was the, what was called the poor white trash. Okay? And the poor white trash, they had something, somebody below. It was very important to them called blacks. So um, built into our genes is the necessity to release tension by finding the scapegoat. And I do want to tell you it happens in families, in school, I mean, it happens everywhere. It's, uh, it's part of what we call the, the hierarchical problem. The fourth implication is um, peacemaking. Um, what we observe in chimp society and bonobo society is uh, that in order for the society to survive, there have to be many strategies for making up because they're living together and there's a lot of competition. So in order to take the edge off the competition, there has to be a lot of cooperation, a lot of nice-nice. So, um, and that's what happens in our culture. Our culture is this mixture of what? Competition and, and cooperation. So, um, in fact, Duval alludes to that uh, here. Primates learn peacemaking early in life. As with everything related to attachment, it starts with the mother-infant bond. During weaning, the mother pushes the infant away from her nipples, yet allows it to return right away when it screams in protest. The interval between rejection and acceptance lengthens with the infant's age, and conflicts turn into major scenes. Mother and offspring bring different weapons to the battlefield. The mother has superior strength, and the offspring a well-developed larynx, uh, as juvenile chimpanzee easily outscream several human children, and equally well-developed blackmailing techniques. The youngster will cajole mother with signs of distress, such as pouts and whimpers, and if all else fails, a temper tantrum at the peak of which he may almost choke in his screams or vomit at her feet. This is the ultimate threat, a literal waste of maternal investment. If you don't take care of me and, and be nice to me, I'll kill myself. <laughs> and then you will have what? Wasted all this energy and money. So there you are. One wild mother's answer to these histrionics was to climb high up into a tree and throw her son to the ground. This was a um, or so it seemed, but the last instant holding on to his ankle. Oh. The young male hung upside down for 15 seconds, screaming his head off before the mother retrieved him. There were no more tantrums that day. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so. So, no, by the way, because um, sometimes children are absolutely adorable and lovable, and sometimes they just get in the way. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just annoying. So we have this, this double response. We need the double response. We can hang the kid out of the branch, but we better not let him, do you understand? We better not let him go. So it's that mixture, it, it's that dance. Uh, it's in chimp society, it's in bonobo society, it's also in human society. So conclusion, and in fact, at the end of the book, Duval reaches certain important conclusions. Ethical behavior, human ethical behavior has its roots in our primate ancestors. We can see it. And in fact, the, the ethical problems we have are also to be found in primate behavior. One of the problems is that we tend to love and nurture the people in our own group. And we tend to fear and hate the people who are outside. 
In fact, in order for us to control it, we have to use sometimes enormous effort. It is not true, given our genetic history, that it is easy to love strangers. Generally, uh, the love and the nurturing has been confined to one's own group. And um, that's why I always say to people, I resent the world becoming homogenized where everybody looks alike and the settings look alike, but actually the more they look alike, the easier it will be for people to deal, do you understand, with strangers because if strangers look outrageously different, it will be difficult for people to uh, respond. The second is that uh, the foundation often of kindness uh, and empathy and whatever else it is, uh, is a function of reciprocity or mutuality. The mother needs the child. That's her what? Her immortality. <laughs> the child needs the, the mother. Uh, the dominant male needs to share because he needs the help of the group in order to have anything to dominate. So often, and he points this out, which you'll find with dominant males among chimps, uh, when they bring something or, or get some food, they will share it uh, with the group because they need the cooperation of th these people. In, in the end, uh, you don't have the intimidation power to control a group without some level of cooperation. So in the end, somebody has to get something out of the connection in order for the connection to, uh, to work. The third, and uh, let me read this to you, something called neoteny. The word neoteny refers to a development among humans. Uh, humans look like, if you look at faces, they look like Baby monkeys. Adult monkeys tend to have a, this heavy brow ridge, whatever else it is, and much more severe look. That's why we're attracted to baby faces even more than we are to the adult faces because they look more like us. Neoteny means that in the process of our evolution, we have preserved in adulthood the body form of childhood. Example, while most of our primate relatives are hairy, we've lost most of the what? The hair, we have a, well, hopefully, well, you know, <laughs> limited. <laughs> no, no, no. We, uh, we have uh, some hair on the top of our heads, around our genital organs, but I mean, the, the point is, we're comparatively hairless. And so neoteny means that instead of uh, assuming the adult forms that primates generally have, we preserve the child forms. And in fact, uh, he says with regard to the bonobos, their behavior, the, the joy and the sharing and the spontaneity in bonobo society is, is a function of what we call neoteny. Now, there's an advantage to neoteny. One, children are more flexible than adults. Uh, and so whatever neoteny there was uh, already existed, if you will, in the, uh, the common ancestor of the chimps, uh, the bonobos, and, and the humans. The one advantage is flexibility, and the other is curiosity both of which lay at the, at the foundation of a dynamic society, all right? So that's, the, that's, that's an interesting uh, implication. The fourth is he calls us the bipolar ape. Why bipolar? Well, part of us is like the bonobo. We can be what? loving and generous and kind and the whole thing. And part of us is like that male chimp. Do you understand? Because if you look at human behavior, 
Uh, we've done worse things than biting off testicles. Got it? So we have both potentials within us. It isn't that we're born basically good and all we need to do is rearrange the culture and then we'll all be loving each other. We're born with both dispositions and in fact uh, there's, a ba there's a balancing act involved. And in fact one of the consequences of the violence, the sources of the violence, are the co is competition. Competition isn't always bad. Uncontrolled competition is what? Is it? So uh, there's, there's this balancing act that goes on. We're, we're, he calls it the bipolar ape. And the, the last thing is, because he talks about visiting a kibbutz in Israel at the very end. Our genetic makeup that we get from our primate inheritance provides us with limitations as to what we can do. One of the most interesting social institutions that was created in Israel was the kibbutz. And in the kibbutz, uh, it was uh, agreed that children did not belong to their parents, they belonged to the community. Therefore, they did not live with their parents and they were not, uh, they didn't eat with their parents, they all ate in a communal what? A communal hall. What they discovered in Israel was the system doesn't work. In the end, parents wanted to be with their, no, they, they wanted to be with their children, the children wanted to be with their, uh, with their parents, uh, and after a while, universally in Israel, that system has totally broken down in the kibbutz because the strongest, longest lasting bond, the one that provides in a sense the motivation for organic behavior is reproduction. After all, the nuclear family, the most powerful institution in terms of human evolution, uh, is the result of, of the desire of males to what? Identify their, uh, their offspring. Mothers have no difficulty because they know who their offspring, they know their offspring. But to separate parents from their children, oh. So when I finish this book, and I recommend you read it because I can only give you, do you understand, a little bit. You turn each page and you say, what? Oh, um, some of it seems like uh, wow, and some of it says, so that's why we behave the way, <laughs> no, so that's why we behave the way we do. Uh, he's rendered a great service, and my prediction for the future is that these books will continue to be published. That is, one of the ways to understand ourselves is not simply through introspection or imaginative political philosophers who invent human nature. If you want to find out what human nature is, you have to check its roots. And those roots lie in the zoo. <laughs> no, 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 those roots lie in the zoo. So now you know what you do. If you see a chimp, run. If you see a bonobo, you can go and do whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Thank <laughs> you.